mentioned earlier that the Barmer Millwall Forest was chosen as an icon site because of its high ecological importance. Um, from our perspective, um, the interpretation of the impacts of this highly variable hydrological system on regional flora and fauna, particularly fish, does require a long-term monitoring program, which has been underway for the last five years in order to monitor the health and status of the fish community and with an emphasis of long-term changes in assessment of fish populations and trying to link these with management interventions in the longer term. Um, but this is not an intervention monitoring program per se that we can look at long-lived fish species and say because of a slight increase in water levels or volume, this is what's going to happen to the fish community in the following year. So in recognition that the forest habitat in Barma Milwa is uh, variable, we've chosen three ecotypes through the system to sample, being rivers, wetlands and creeks. Twelve creek and wetland sites were chosen throughout the forest, just to give us a broad picture of what's going on. Um, sampling was conducted in February, because as you realise, in order to access these sites, we need the water levels to be high enough so that the fish can get in there for a start, and low enough, I guess, for us to be able to get in there and conduct our monitoring. Uh, we're following a standard SRA monitoring protocol and in the creeks and wetlands the, that was predominantly using backpack electrofishing. So we would go through and monitor using a backpack and we would pulse five, six hundred volts of DC current into the water to override the fish's sensory system, collect them, weigh, measure and in other programs insert transistors for long-term movement patterns. We also use bait traps to catch small-bodied small, uh, yeah, small -bodied fish. Uh, there was eight sites, eight river sites, two of those on the Edwards River as it's a smaller system, and two each in the lower mid and upper Murray system. Sampling was conducted later on in the year where the main channel Water heights were a little bit lower, but this was to coincide also with the ability to catch the Murray River crayfish, because that's when they start to move. Uh, we're still using SRA sampling protocol, but that was using large electrofishing boats. Uh, Manana nets, as you can see in the far right bottom picture there, were used to capture the crayfish. Uh, a riverine spawning was added to the program to continue not only work that we were doing at ARI previously to the, the, the TLM work here, but we wanted that to try to support what we were finding with the large bodied fish species as well, because that was providing particular data on the large bodied species, presence, absence sort of stuff, but if we were to gain information on spawning and movement, that was going to be a, of benefit too. So we set three drift nets at three different sites, the top, bottom and middle of the Barmer Millwall system, and sampling was conducted fortnightly toward the end of the year. Hydrology. Large scale flooding in 2010, as we've previously heard. You can see here that Prior to our monitoring program, there was an environmental flow sent down the river, followed by five years of drought, which was in turn followed by the large or a couple of large flood events in 2010, which coincided with a blackwater event and then a return to normal conditions. It's worth noting that floodplain inundation is, is about 10,000 megalitres a day and that the, the, uh, the drought 
resulted in a lack of water on the floodplain over that period. So this instantly says to us we need to work out the impacts of these large events being floods, droughts and consequently black water in this case and how do our fish communities respond. Overall, we started off here looking at creeks. Um, I guess the general trend here looking at the blue line is that during the drought native fish species, particularly large bodied species in this graph, were doing quite well and dominated the system. However, when the drought, uh, sorry, the flood and consequent black water came through in 2010, the native fish populations crashed. And the inverse can be seen with the alien fish populations. The peak there in the aliens is dominated by young of year carp, which presumably left the creek systems a year later. So interesting listening to Katie's talk, she mentioned Tongalong Creek. If you look at the, the graph on the bottom left of the Murray Cod, they had a peak in abundance in Tongalong Creek immediately following the floods. Now Tongalong Creek is above the section of river that was impacted by black water and we presume that Murray Cod might, might have been using Tongalong Creek as a refuge from the impacts of the black water. Uh, gudgeons, you can see they've dominated during the drought and then crashed. Carp inverse and eastern Gambusia have, have done pretty well regardless of the drought. A lot of these changes um, in the fish communities, whether it be lakes or creeks, wetlands, that sort of thing, is associated with availability of habitat and the changes in that habitat and particularly spawning for things like carp. So the overall trend, once again, is a decline in native fish species in the lakes and the wetlands and an increase in the aliens driven predominantly in lakes and wetlands by Gambusia. Very similar picture with the rivers. Native species dominated during the drought. You're heavily impacted by the drought and or black water post 210. Interestingly, golden perch have increased within the riverine system over that time. We think this is because it's a transient species. So it, they move through systems and I think that there's been records of them moving a couple of thousand kilometres. So potentially they weren't impacted as heavily as resident species such as Murray Cod and Trout Cod. <coughs> as mentioned before, the, the large uh, spike in the carp population was due to young of year. Oh, one thing that we should note is electrofishing efficiency because this is all done using boat and backpack electrofishing. We have to be really mindful of turbidity and water height due to the, the biology of the fish that we're looking at. So trout cod and Murray cod predominantly live around snags and for 90% of their life can stay within two square metres of that snag. So if that piece of timber is a metre and a half below the surface of the water and we can maintain a field of probably eight to ten feet with the large electrofishing boats, we'll pick it up. But if we get a two metre rise or even a one metre rise in water level, we'll have real problems actually trying to detect the fish even if it's actually there. And even if you can knock them out, the, the flow will probably carry them away and it's, it's often more turbid. So your chances of picking up fish, even if they are there, is really quite low. So we have to keep that in mind. The larval drift data do support the condition monitoring trends. Whilst, um, as I mentioned, there's a bit of information on spawning cues for fish uh, different species even amongst the natives. 
whilst these charts show that the, the green line is um, Ladgroves Beach, which was above the flood and the black water, our, our site, whereas the other two were um, impacted by the um, black water, although only partially in the in the middle site. We're actually out there fishing and you could see that the whole river was delineated with a black line where the black water was flowing in from, from the lake system. Um, it sort of is indicative that that site that wasn't impacted by the black water as much as the other ones is in better condition. However, the number of eggs that we caught were really, really low. I think here it's 25 and 40 is the top of these graphs and Zeb mentioned to me earlier that 10 years ago they were catching tens of thousands of eggs per drift sample. So whilst it, it does tell us a, a little bit about the condition, um, it also tells us that the whole system really has been a ma have, has had a massive impact on spawning of native fish species. Murray crayfish. You can see here in the in in the red circle that morning glory prior to the black water and the floods was really where we picked up uh, most of our crayfish. That was like the stronghold for us. And then following the black water, we haven't picked up any crayfish to date. Um, however. The numbers of crayfish in the non-blackwater affected sites, which previously had very few crayfish, are now starting to dominate. So uh, clearly this is cause for concern, and I actually wrote this before the, uh, the changes came out from the department. Um, but yeah, so we wanted to see if, how this would possibly feed into management options by, ch by changing uh, take limits and putting greater restrictions on sizes and, and seasonal removal of craze. <coughs> so in, in summary, it's, it's difficult to determine the influence of drought and black water in isolation on the fish community because they both occurred together and in some sites they split our sites in half so it, analytically, it's very difficult to attribute all of the changes, particularly when there's been changes, uh, opposing changes in different native species and the large change in, um, between aliens and natives. But we can look at the impact of those large scale events together and we've seen through the charts that there's been a massive decline in Murray cod, trout cod and crayfish, a large increase in golden perch and a massive increase in alien fish, which is something that's led us to notice that the alien fish species are always, or in this investigation anyway, are always the first to recolonise habitats that have been impacted by large events such as the Blackwater and we're currently writing a, a research paper on that. So in conclusion, fish monitoring is an essential tool, particularly uh, when we're in a position to use that to feed into future management decisions um, and to monitor the impact of these events, particularly into the future because we know now that it, that large scale event had a huge impact on our native fish species. And the reverse is true obviously for aliens, but we want to know, as I suspect everybody else, what's going to happen in the future, you know? So the investigation ultimately highlights the, uh, the value of long-term monitoring to inform management decisions, particularly those with fish. And we have had Luckily for us, I guess, we've had the large scale event come through after five, six years of drought, and that's enabled us to pick up the impacts of those large scale events 
on fish species. And just lastly, you know, this, this is a, a large collaborative research project between ourselves and New South Wales. Uh, and th there's a lot of field staff and a lot of field hours, so thank you.